So I'm going to talk a, a little bit higher than balloons, uh, but one reason I wanted to bring this up is it uses the same radios that we're starting to use for things like tracking radio song. So the SDR radios, um, don't know enough about them yet, but I'm finding they're pretty amazing. So one of the first projects was to record images from weather satellites using them. And my next project is to actually use one as a radio telescope that I hope I can talk about sometime in the future. Uh, so this is going to be specifically about recording low Earth orbiting uh, weather satellites. Uh, there are several, uh, four of them that pass over twice a day, about 12 hours apart from each other. Depending on your position and what orbital plane they're in, you can get one of them on two, on two passes, you know, 90 minutes apart. Um, oops, let me let that not go to my next slide. Okay. Um, I hit enter. Okay, there we go. Okay. No, it's okay. So, um, Space Age, you know, started back in uh, October 4th. I know I'm missing a slide here. Uh, again. Okay. Um, so, Space Age started back on October 4th, uh, 1957. And even prior to, to the launch of, you know, of Sputnik 1 by the Soviet Union, people were asking what could you potentially do in space? So a couple of ideas that were early space, space age ideas. One of them was spy satellites. You know, one of the problems is that we in the United States wanted to know how many missiles the Soviet Union had. Now, you know, they were claiming they were rolling missiles off the assembly line like sausages. They weren't. We had no way of knowing. We did try to launch aircraft. So the U-2 to start with and the SR-71 significantly later on. But there's some difficulty with overflying Soviet airspace. It is a violation of the airspace. Also, uh, even though they're high altitude and high speeds, they still represent a target that can be shot down. Another idea was communication satellites. You know, uh, we use radio towers to do communications, but all the way back to 1945, Wireless World magazine, Arthur C. Clarke had talked about using satellites in geostationary orbit act as a basically a tall cell phone tower or repeater so we could have communications around the world another uh, idea they had come up was with navigation <clears throat> now we had some navigation methods that worked on land at sea uh, but it was, uh, it was a significantly more difficult problem the question is could we use uh, satellites to do navigation Another idea that came up, early idea that came up was launching telescopes into space. The atmosphere blocks a lot of electromagnetic radiation from reaching the surface of the earth. So there's things we can't see. Um, we see some infrared, some visible, but there's much more infrared we would like to see, ultraviolet, even x-rays. And we can't see those from the surface of the earth because of the atmosphere, which actually is a good thing for us because the radiation would kill us. But astronomers would like to get uh, to view the universe in those wavelengths. Um, by doing so, you discover more things. In fact, every time a new band opens up, you learn something. And the last of what I'll focus on would be uh, weather well, satellites to help things like weather forecasting. So the first satellites that came out were the Corona satellites, um, and people knew of them as, I guess the classified name was Keyhole. So Keyhole, and it's like you're looking through a keyhole. Um, so they started developing this. That was the first thing we, we were developing uh, to be uh, other than being um, first to do something, we actually wanted some real information from space and spy satellites for the first time. It turns out that one of the first flights that they sent, the first successful flight they sent with these Corona satellites, one mission and the film that we, re that we recovered from that one mission, and we knew more about the uh, Soviet Union's missile capability than we'd ever known before. There was no risk to human life. It was a satellite, couldn't shoot it down. Um, and then also the VELA satellites. The VELA satellites were designed to detect the radiation from a nuclear blast. So we could detect when not only Soviet Union, but China or any other countries were uh, detonating atomic bombs or nuclear bombs. We could detect the radiation with those with the VELA satellite. And now back in 1967, they detected a blast of gamma rays uh, from a, a, what they thought was initially was a test by coordinating abusing a coordinating when each of the satellites detected the blast, it was determined it was not on Earth, but it was actually in space. And that was the first time we'd actually detected these gamma ray bursts coming from the deep, deep universe. 
and it had to remain secret for over a decade. We couldn't tell, or the so the United States couldn't tell astronomers about these uh, these gamma ray bursts that were happening in the sky. So we, uh, you know, tried to detect covert secret atomic bomb blasts. Uh, they one of the first things actually detected were astronomical events in the deep, deep universe uh, for these gamma ray bursts. Communication satellites, you know, started in very early space age, uh, July 1st, 1962, uh, Telstra was launched. And that it was the first time, you know, we could actually transmit signals uh, from ground through space back to the ground again, get these wide hops wider than you could do with microwave towers on the ground. And CINCOM 3 was launched in time for the Tokyo Olympics. It was the first time the world had observed events going on at the Olympics everywhere in the world, they could, could watch this. And then of course, amateur radio operators like us arranged to send up a uh, first satellite, Oscar, Oscar one, that was a satellite carrying amateur radio, um, December 1961. The satellite was made with $22 worth of parts and was launched for free out of a military flight out of Vandenberg. And it only worked for a few weeks or a couple months, as I recall. But it actually, the, the amateur radio operators are sending communication satellites up first or before uh, the rest of the world was doing it commercially. Navigation satellites, uh, the first one was transit. And transit, the, that's the one on the left, was used by nuclear submarines. A submarine could travel to some place in the oceans, open up the, the launch tubes and start launching missiles. You're not going to hit your target unless you know where you're located. And we would use things like sextants and timing and, and time of flight and that kind of thing, you know, how long you've been traveling to determine location. But your accuracy was not that good. With transit, the satellite or the, uh, these nuclear submarines would know where, in this case here, these uh, ballistic submarines, nuclear ballistic submarines would know their location in less than, in less than a mile error and could accurately launch missiles. And then later on, starting about 1985, mid-1980s, mid uh, the Navstar satellites were launched, and that became, that is the basis for the GPS system that we use today. Astronomy satellites, you know, once we started launching um, rockets that reached above the surface of the Earth, they could actually do some detection of radiation, but you only got these real quick bursts of, of information as the rocket, sounding rocket came up and came back down again. Um, once you get satellites into space, we're detecting things like gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, and infrared. Uh, parts of electromagnetic spectrum we can't see from the ground. And even invisible light, which we can see from the ground, once you got into space and above this distorting atmosphere that we have, you actually had uh, steady seeing and you had clear images. The telescope, the optics could reach their maximum um, ability to resolve objects. So they were seeing much, much, much better images. And we all know Hubble Space Telescope, really the most famous satellite ever launched by the United States and the wonderful images that it's returned. But now let's kind of focus on weather, which does affect us when we do our balloon launches. So in the old days, if we wanted to collect information about the weather, we would use surface instruments. So on the left is an example of a, a national a, a NOAA or National Weather Service or and also NOAA weather station where they're detecting things like temperature, pressure, relative humidity, wind speed, wind direction. And then uh, that gives you just a location right there. What's, what's the weather like right there? Uh, also, we would launch weather, weather balloons like we do now. They could carry up sensors that could detect uh, or measure the temperature, pressure, relative humidity. And in the old days, by using, the, using radio and tracking the balloon, you could get its altitude, you get the, the, how, how fast its climb rate, you get its altitude. And using azimuth and elevation to determine location, to determine wind speed. And now with the, what the half, the first half of a GPS engine that's put into them, you actually can get 3D position uh, using GPS on them. That data is local, not synoptic. Now synoptic means to observe over a wide range. So over an entire state, for instance, that'd be an idea of, of synoptic measurements. And that's really vital because it tells you what's coming, not just what things are right now, and then you make predictions. But actually, can you look over the horizon and see what's going on? Starting on April 1st, 1960, so just before I was born, Eros-1, and this is uh, infrared, um, 
infrared imaging from a, a television infrared um, from space, a satellite, so Tiros one, actually started taking images and actually taking pictures of the ground uh, using, uh, using its cameras. You can actually see images of cloud formation. And it was launched on this rocket on the left of Thor Abel, uh, which later on was evolved to become the Delta rockets. Uh, which is, I think, still flying, or they're just about ready to retire them. It's, it's evolved over time. Tiros-1, this infrared, television, television infrared satellite, um, taking images from space. The orbits that was first put into were about 400 miles up, had two cameras, uh, used slow scan. So rapidly take a picture and then slow scan the images back down to the ground again. Uh, two cameras, there was a wide angle and then a uh, zoom lens. So you can see uh, images or details as small as 1.5 images or zoom in to see images as small or objects as small as a thousand foot. Uh, the satellite was not actively controlled. So they use uh, sun and horizontal sensors and that would tell you the orientation of the satellite. And if you knew its position, which you would know because you calculate the orbit and its orientation, you knew what you were looking, looking, at, looking at on the ground. The first satellite, the first Tiros lasted for 75 days before it died. The image on the right is the first image that was transmitted by Tiros once. That's the first weather satellite image from space. And which really important to notice here is that you can't see the ground. You see the clouds, but you don't see the ground. Because of the sun and horizontal sensors, we can tell you exactly what you're looking at here because you know where the satellite is pointed. So even though you can't see the ground, and you know, look at a map of the ground, you can at least tell where you're looking at, you know where these cloud formations are located. But with this image, you realize we're talking about synoptic scale imaging. We are seeing multiple states. We're seeing in you know, most of a country that, that, that kind of imaging with these satellites. Uh, Tiros has evolved over time. Uh, and now there's Tiros 19 this is the one that's currently in operation. It's no longer a, um, controlled satellite that rotates and sends images with you know 1.5 mile resolution they're actually actively guided and return a significantly wider range or frequencies or wavelengths of images to the ground not just infrared but visible thermal infrared infrared uh, you know not thermal infrared near infrared so those are the images that are being returned now uh, so much much better detail uh, than we are we used to get in the past so one of the issues that comes up with weather satellites is you can put them in these different orbits, but which orbit is the best? If you put the orbit of the satellite into an orbit that's equatorial, then that means it's gonna sit above the ground, above the horizon, one place. So it's easy to point an antenna at it and just keep it, keep it locked in there. If you're far away, so you don't, your images are not as detailed unless you have a you know, nice telephoto uh, zoom lens on the thing. Also, you're stuck at what you can see because you see primarily the equator as the best detail. And as you approach the poles, your ability to resolve uh, goes down. Partly, it's not so much the distance as much as the ground is tilting away from the satellite. So you're seeing things more edge on rather than face on. It's very difficult to get good images of the polar regions or upper, you know, polar regions of the, well, I should say upper and lower, northern and southern polar regions of the Earth with an equatorial satellite. Uh, you could the satellite into an inclined orbit. It would take less energy to get there, so your rocket booster doesn't have to be as powerful. You're not going as far. But now you you can't see the majority of the Earth. You can only see maybe a thousand miles off of each side. And if your if your inclination is low, you don't see much of the Earth. So you could try to increase your inclination. Another way, in fact, you can get to a point where the inclination where you're polar. So now you're going over the poles. Now you see all of the ground twice a day, once on the northbound pass, once on the southbound pass, so on the other side of the Earth, so 12, 12 hours later. Uh, but the issue with a polar orbiting satellite is, if you just leave it where it's at, what images you see today, say maybe at like three o'clock, or well, maybe three months from now, you're passing over that location at say 11 o'clock in the morning. The lighting conditions change. Changing lighting conditions make it difficult to understand what you're seeing because now you're seeing shadows versus no shadows. It makes it difficult. The part of the problem is, and this is something that goes back to orbital mechanics. If you took a class in astrodynamics, you would, you would cover this. 
First off is that orbit satellites, we would actually describe with several parameters. One is inclination, you know, how, how tilted are you relative to the, to the equator? Uh, your perigene apogee, how close and how far are you from the surface of the earth? Eccentricity, how out of orbit, how out of um, round is your orbit? Also argument of the perigee is another important one. And that is that orbit points to, you know, would line up with a particular set of stars and stays that way. And that's because orbits are inertial. We think of mass as being inertial. So I have a block, it's heavy, it doesn't want to move, or if it's moving, it's difficult to stop it. Orbits act the same way. These parameters that we use to describe an orbit stay the same. They don't like to change. So it's almost as if these were different uh, aspects of mass of an orbit and they don't want to change. So the picture I showed at the bottom shows an orbit, a satellite's orbit around the Earth as the Earth is around the sun. And you'll notice I drew the orbits so they maintain the same orientation as the Earth moves around the sun. So the image that's closest to us, a satellite would be passing over the Earth at some particular location at noon. Well, three months later, when we're on the right side of the orbit, that satellite passes over some location of the Earth at, at about a sunset around six o'clock. And then on the far, uh, the image six, uh, three months later, where Earth is beyond the, the sun in our image here, now that a satellite's passing over a location of the Earth at midnight, but also 12 hours later at noon. You can see the orbit maintains the same orientation relative to the fixed stars because the Earth rotates around the sun. What we pass, what time you pass over the Earth uh, changes. So we'd be, you know, six in the morning versus noon versus six in the evening versus uh, six p.m. So this will change over time. What we want to do is create an orbit that's called sun synchronous. And that means that the orbit has to process. Now, process means the orbit rotates in space. So it rel rotates relative to the star. You would like to see an orbit process by 360 degrees per year or roughly one degree per day. If you do that, then the orbit is changing its orientation relative to the stars because the Earth is rotating around the Earth you pass over the same location of Earth at the same time. So if I can make the orbit process at 360 degrees per year and make the satellite pass over my location at three o'clock, every day I will pass over my location at three o'clock and lighting conditions stay the same. The way to do that is you need to apply a torque. So it's, it's an off-centered force and you can torque orbit so that it processes. Uh, the easiest first way to do that is you put thrusters on your satellite. However, uh, once you run out of propellant for the thrusters, you can't change, you can't control the satellite anymore. It does give you a limited lifetime that the satellite can operate. You would like the satellite, you know, if the electronics are going to last for years or over a decade, you'd like your thrusters to last over, you know, over, over 10 years, right? Um, but they, you, we can't do that with this, with this, with uh, a lot of satellites. Now, there's ways we can do it with, with ion thrusters, uh, but there's an even easier, cheaper way to do this. Rather than carry up talent and, 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 and thrusters to, to, to actually work your orbit, we'll use the Earth to do it. Because the Earth is not a perfect sphere. It's actually an oblate sphere. It's actually crushed. The poles are a little bit smaller and the, the equator is a little bit wider. That means we have an unequal distribution of mass across the Earth. It's not like the mass of the Earth is located at the center, centered at, at the very center of the Earth. It's actually, it's actually extends out to the sides a little bit. And the picture I'm showing here on the right, I'm showing a satellite orbit that's tipped at roughly 45 degrees. It's got an inclination of 45 degrees. Different parts of the Earth will pull on that orbit at different amounts, and that acts as a torque. That is an off-center force, and it forces the orbit to process, to rotate around the Earth. So now we're using the Earth's gravity to force an orbit to rotate or to process, get it to happen just at the perfect amount so that it actually will rotate relative to the fixed stars one, ro one revolution every year. Um, now, there's calculations that, that have been made. Once we know the mass of the Earth and, and, it's, and how late it is, you can actually calculate what the tilt and the height should be. So this is a factor of both tilt, inclination, and height. You know, if you're too far away from the Earth, then the mass can't pull as much, and you'll need to be closer to the equator to get that torquing. 
So I'm, there's this table here I'm showing here on the left. It shows you what the inclination has to be on the right side to get it to rotate once every, every year. That also tells you how high you have to be, what the inclination has to be. Well, let's start from the beginning. So the left side is how many, how many orbits are you going to get per day? You go 16 orbits per day, we go seven orbits per day. Uh, the period, if you're rotating 16 orbits per day, your period is an hour and 30 minutes. If you're going to have seven orbits per day, your, your period is going to be three hours and 26 minutes. Your height is in kilometers. And then the inclination on the very right shows you how you what your tilt is relative to the poles. And then the maximal latitude is what part of the Earth you cross over. So maximum, so if you're going to have 16 orbits per day, and you're willing to be at 274 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, you will assess at once per year. Your inclination is 96 degrees, and the maximum latitude you'll pass over is 83.4 degrees. I get you a big chunk of the Earth. Uh, you'll notice that the inclinations are greater than 90 degrees. So that means not only did you go up to the poles, but you also went back, you went back a little bit. And by doing that, you're actually rotating counter to the direction the Earth rotates, so they call it a retrograde orbit. So these orbits are all retrograde orbits. But by using these sun synchronous orbits, and again, you just look at how high do you want to be, and therefore uh, what the period will be, and then uh, what your inclination has to be, you automatically will assess at 360 degrees per year. And then on the right side, I'm showing the four NOAA satellites that are currently operational and what their inclinations look like. Okay, these are the satellites we're going to observe with this ground station that I'm going to describe. Uh, what's really nice about them is that the signals are very strong. It's very easy to receive the signals, um, and you can get really good resolutions with them. The objects you're going to need are the things you're going to need. The items you'll need. Number one is a turnstile antenna, uh, and um, I, I talk a little where I got where I got mine from. You can make your own. You need you'll need an SDR radio. You need the dongle style. The software you need is SDR Sharp, and that's designed for these SDR radios. The weather software is, is uh, weather to image. So WX stands for weather. So the, satellite, the imaging software is called weather to image. You need a virtual audio cable. And that virtual audio cable takes the data received by SDR Sharp and then gives it to weather to image. So it's basically a uh, software audio cable to connect the receiver to the weather, the weather, uh, weather uh, software. The weather software uses the audio signal. Um, so it wants to hear what, what, what does it sound like? It doesn't want to see uh, anything other than sound. And then of course a laptop, you can put this on a PC, but if you do that, your PC is inside, you're opening up the window, you're dragging your cable outside. It's just easier to get a laptop so you can uh, take the stuff, the stuff outside. I'd also recommend a folding ladder or, or a table so you can set the stuff out. So that uh, you can put on the on the on, on surface rather than on say the grass, which might be damp. I also recommend that you stay with your software because I have had a case where a robin landed on my laptop. When birds land, they like to do their business, and I had to clean up my laptop a little bit. So I'm going to recommend you stay with your laptop consistently. Um, okay, so the antenna I got was from AMSAT UK. And they built this for the Fun Cube, or they were selling it for the Fun Cube radio, uh, Fun Cube satellite, which is a, uh, a, a cube sat that's that's in orbit, and you can receive uh, images or uh, receive uh, signal from it. Um, but you can also make your own turn style antenna; they're fairly easy to make. It's about sixty-five dollars. The SDR uh, SDR radio I got off of Amazon was thirty-five dollars. This is the standard SDR radio they sell, so. Ready to lose software defined radio, small enough, I could call it ready to lose. They're small enough to lose. So rtlsdr.com and uh, $35. So now we're talking about $100 for the hardware. The software is free, AirSpy and use SDR Sharp and AirSpy. Weather to image, now it turns out weather to image was written several years ago, it's no longer supported. So what uh, people have done is they've gotten, this, they've gotten permission to make the software available online. It has been a restored copy of it, so you can download uh, the free the free copy. It's still, still available. It's no longer supported. That's okay because the satellites still uh, send and transmit data the way they've, they've always done. So 
So if someone was uh, smart enough and, and got you know, permission from the writer who was kind enough, to make this uh, software still available. And then the virtual audio cable is basically a driver, vbaudio.com. You can download that, that audio cable, uh, that virtual audio cable. All these things together, and I've got my setup right here. I use the laptops or the uh, folding uh, uh, ladder so it's easy to haul everything out. And like I said, you want to stay with this setup. I've had a bird actually land on the ladder, do its business on my laptop, and I had to clean that up. So uh, don't leave it out. Just you know, be there with it constantly. Okay, so this is SDR Sharp. This is what SDR Sharp looks like. And uh, several of you have, have played with this already if you're doing checking your radio songs. One thing you need to do is set the, set the, the source, which is going to be your TL SDR USB radio. So tell it which, what the radio is. Set the frequency. Frequency you'll find out from a weathered image. They'll tell you what the frequency is. Not only that, but weathered image will also tell you when the satellite's going to pass over. Um, at the source, uh, the frequency, oh, set it to wide FM. The satellite's transmitted FM. Because of Doppler shift, the uh, signal's going gonna, gonna to shift a bunch, several, um, I think several, almost like 20 kilohertz or something like that. So set to wide FM. Uh, set your radio. Uh, there they go, bandwidth. So it's our bandwidth. There we go. And then also set the bandwidth to 45, 000, uh, 45 kilohertz is what I set the bandwidth to. And this set your output, and the output goes to the uh, audio cable. You see on the bottom there under audio output, it's to the cable. It's the cable input to weather to image. And that's, that is your, your driver, your virtual cable driver. So a couple of things to set. These options are all sticky. Uh, so once you set it up, you're good. All you have to do is change the frequency when different satellites pass over. So this is SDR sharp, and this is while it's receiving an image. So the top is showing the top screen on the right shows you the, you know, the, the intensity of the signal, and the right and the below that is your waterfall display of the image. Now, if you look on the very right, you get that. If you look on the very right, you got a strong signal, and it gives you that sort of a warble uh, pattern to the uh, waterfall. That's because the signal is being transmitted as a fax image. So it's getting a, it's kind of scans the ground, so you get this whoop, whoop. Whoop, the camera scans the ground and that shows up as that kind of butterfly, multiple butterfly effect on the on the waterfall. And then you know you've got a signal, you got a good, nice, uh, strong signal. Okay, once you get weathered image, there's two things you need to do. As soon as you get it, you need to set your PC clock. And I would set your PC clock every week or so. Laptop um, PCs just don't maintain um, their time that accurately. And when you're looking at these images, if you're a quarter of a second off, there's going to be a slight, it's not, you still get images, but there'll be a slight problem that I'm going to show you what, what happens when you don't set your PT clock. The Keplerian elements, uh, this is named after Johannes Kepler, who figured out that the planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits and figured out how to actually calculate the position of planets in the future. The Keplerian elements or two line elements, TLEs, two line elements, describe all the aspects of a satellite so you can predict where it's going to be in the future. And you'll need to update these every couple of weeks because the satellites, they do, they're not perfect. They do adjust their, their positions just a little bit. So you'll have to um, uh, update elements and get the latest elements from the satellite. So you'll know what's going to show up within, you know, half a second rather than being, you know, 30 seconds off or something like that. So update those elements. Uh, once you've got your weather to satellite um, software, uh, WXTO IMD software running, the first thing you want to do is get a list of satellite passes. So I go to file, and then I do a list satellite passes. This little pop-up shows up, and it shows you the different satellites to so know in 19, 18, you know, uh, 15. These are the satellites. It shows you the direction, whether it's northbound or southbound. Northbound means it starts in the south and it's going north. The MEL is the maximum elevation. And that's where, um, how high above the horizon it appears to you. So for this first one here, NOAA 19, its smell is 27 east. So I know I need to point the antenna starting in the south. And I'm going to drift to the north, and or it's going to go to the north. And it's only going to be 27 degrees at maximum above the eastern horizon. Longitude tells me that it passes over the earth. It's going to be looking down, straight down at 102 west longitude when, when it passes over the earth. 
local time is going to be when I when I start seeing it. So I'll have to go out at uh, let's see, was that five nineteen oh five? It just wants to start wants to get above high enough other person for me to uh, see it. TC time, I don't use that. Duration, this is going to be a twelve minute and thirty two second pass. It'll take twelve minutes to pass. Then the frequency one thirty seven point one zero 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 megahertz. And that's what I need to set my software for. So this will tell you everything you need to know, and I mean, this goes for a week. And I can get what. Um, what the satellite passes are going to be. I have to say, scroll down this. And I only do it for like a day in advance, but I can, I know when satellites are going to pass over now. I'm ready. I'm ready for them. I can set up, be, I need to be out maybe 10 minutes before the satellite starts uh, making its pass, and I can be ready for it to record the image. The, uh, the STR Sharp records the, the radio signal, uh, records the radio signal, it's an audio file. And then, um, whether the image software records the, the sound file, it wants the sound file. It records as a sound file and stores it on your laptop. And you can do some processing with it after it's in fact, It'll do processing as it happens, but you can do some later processing if you would like. And what you've got is, is grayscale images. So uh, 256 bytes uh, in, in um, grayscale is what, you, is what you're gonna get. And the, like I said, the images are, are sent to you as a scan, as, as like a, a fax image. You know, normally you think of a fax image, I've got a scanner that looks at the paper and it scans left and right as the paper rolls underneath that. Well, these weather satellites, these NOAA satellites have a camera that scans the earth and the satellite passes over there. So it's basically it's making a fax image of the ground below it. I'm ready now to start receiving a signal. I would go into file, I would go into record, and I'll just hit the auto record button on the lower left. I hit that button and it will say, hey, the satellite's going to be passing over at this time. And I'm going to be ready to record when it starts. It, it's all automatic. Um, so it's really nice. And I just have to sit there, wait for the image to start up, and I'll just keep following the satellite with the antenna. You don't have to do that, but you get better images of the northern and southern regions if you will point the antenna at the ground, at the, at the satellite rather than point it straight up. You could put an amplifier on the antenna too. I mean, that runs off of the SDR sharp rate or the SDR radios are designed for that also. And you could just point the antenna straight up, leave it mounted up permanently and then receive satellite images every time they come over. The software will, will track them for you. You just need to be able to change the SDR sharp radio to the new new frequency. From here, it just starts recording images. You sit there and do this wait for them to start showing up. And what I've got here on the left is, this is what the process looks like as, as it's recording an image. I've got two channels are being displayed. The right side is a thermal image. The left side is a visible to near infrared image. This is taken during the winter time. This is looking up to the north. So north in Canada, it's still dark. Um, this is an early morning pass. And if I were to record this during the summer, North would be well lit because the sun doesn't see, you know, doesn't set as you go, or you know, sets later and later until you get to the Arctic Circle, and then it doesn't set at all. So this is a winter, a winter uh, pass, and it's still dark up north because I recorded uh, this image earlier in the morning. What images you get? Well, you'll always get two images. If it's a daytime pass, you get sensors two and four. If it's a nighttime pass, you get sensors three and four. You notice know, you always get a thermal infrared image. The question is, if it's daytime, you'll get partial visual near infrared image. But if it's a nighttime, you get mid and thermal in infrared images because there's no light to see. So there's no reason to turn on sensor. sensor so the satellite actually records a lot more data than this. Um, but the two that are transmitted with this APT or automatic, um, like automatic transmission uh, is only sensors two and four or three and four. And those are the what you're going to look at. If you want to know what you're looking at, you want to do a daytime pass. But if you're just interested in what the heat map looks like, you can always use sensor, uh, sensor four, and you can get that during daytime or nighttime. Okay, so raw images. Once the satellite is done, the image is done, so the satellite is finished up, this is what the images will look like. Uh, the VFAX image that it transmits puts a color bar on the left and right side, which gives you a start for each scan, so you can line those things up. And the right side is my thermal image. Left side is a visible uh, and near infrared image. On the right side, I can I can hardly see the coast. What I do see is just because it's cooler or warmer. Um, colder is bright, and then warmer is dark. 
So on the left is visible. So it looks like invisible linear infrared. On the right, you can line them up and see what's going on. So I can see Vancouver Island. And on the right side, I can see that Vancouver Island is warmer than the Pacific Ocean just off, you know, just off the coast. Clouds are even colder yet because they're better white. Uh, but you'll notice that <clears throat> if I get out in, further into the Pacific, I do see some faint gray clouds. And those are fairly bright white on the left side. It just tells me that those bright white clouds I see on the right are higher elevation, they're colder. And the clouds that are grayer are lower elevation. So now I have some idea of the cloud type and the, the, the temperature of the cloud by looking at that infrared, image, that thermal infrared image. On the left, it looks like this is just all clouds. On the right, I can tell you that this cloud right in here, this is lower elevation. It's not as high. It's cold. It's warmer. This is higher elevation cloud because it's colder. I can see that. And here I can see, a, here's the cloud here, out here. The cloud in here comes out kind of a light gray. It's this cloud here. And that just tells me this is lower elevation. This may be more like um, fog rolling in or stuff that's on the ground that's rolling in. Um, this is a colorized image that a satellite, the software can put together. And this is where it takes the infrared and uh, the visible and says, they should be roughly this color that gives you a color. It also will print and display the, uh, the boundaries for states and countries. Now, this is a clock error. I, this clock was off by maybe a quarter of a second on my laptop when I took this image. You'll see that the satellite, the software says, well, this should be where my boundary is at based on the time I'm receiving the signal. The time I'm receiving the signal is what it gets from the clock, the PC clock. So if you don't align your clock, if you don't align your clock and synchronize your clock, it will draw the boundaries incorrectly, and you'll get this this warped, this boundary that doesn't fit in with fit in with the state or with the, with the country. Uh, but again, it's easy to change. Just go and synchronize your clock. Um, let's see, I gotta get this image here so I can see what I got here. Oh, so temperature pixel. Um, so you can't see my mouse, but I put, I pointed the mouse at at one of these on the screen here. And by looking at the brightness and grayscale on the lower right, you'll see that it said it was minus 4.9 degrees Celsius. I don't know where I was pointing, probably a cloud. So the top of this cloud at right this point here was minus 4.9 degrees Celsius. It can tell you the temperature of these pixels. Again, I, it doesn't show the, the mouse when I do a screen print. So I don't know where the mouse is pointed, but that temperature probably looking at, at a cloud. The way that plus there, I put in my location. So that's where my house is actually located in the state of Idaho. And it actually puts an X there. I don't actually have a large X like that on my property that shows up from place. Um, Multispectral images. So uh, what I think is really kind of cool is satellite or the software makes some assumptions about the color of the ground based on the location. And then based on the infrared and visible images, it will actually kind of estimate what the ground would look like in visible light. So now I've got an image that shows, and this is after it's been processed. And again, it, it weathered image does this processing automatically. You don't have to do this, it's all automatic. I just select what I wanna look at. Uh, but that's the image of the ground and what it should look like if um, I were in space looking down. And I can see you know, the clouds rolling in, uh, my location, the state boundaries, et cetera. Latitude, longitude, those kind of things. A uh, thermal image. So that's all the way again, so I can see. So this is a thermal image of the ground. Now I did this one at night because I didn't want to have the visible light getting in the way. Again, remember what I said is that bright is cold and dark is warm. So we got these cold, high elevation cloud, high altitude clouds out here. And you got this, you know, this is a low, low kind of rolling, rolling through here. Look down here, Arizona, Southern California. It's hot down here. Baja California, Baja California. This is all hot, so it's very dark down here. And this right here, this little squiggle here, that's the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon, you know, 4,000 feet deeper than the surface at the, when you get to the bottom, is an extension of the Mojave Desert. So the heat the temperature we see in the Mojave Desert down here, actually the heat continues throughout the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So I can actually see the Grand Canyon through here. Colorado Plateau is in here, it's higher elevation, so a little cooler off the Colorado Plateau into, into like places like Yuma, Arizona and uh, Javi, California. And it's, it's darn right toasty, <laughs> I'd probably put it politely, toasty down there and it's awfully, it's awfully warm. 
um, here, Salt Lake City, other Great Salt Lake. Water in the Great Salt Lake retains, you know, retains a, you know, a thermal mass, retains temperature. So I can see that the Great Salt Lake is a little bit it's significantly warmer than the surrounding countryside. The Colorado River, which flows right through here, I can see where the Colorado River is coming out right through here into the Green River and, and stuff like that. I can see where the, where the I can see these rivers because the, the water is warmer than the ground surrounding it. And then uh, Central California is warmer. Get up into the Sierra Nevadas and the uh, Pachapis, cooler, higher elevation, cooler, and I can I can see that happening. Uh, colorized sea tra surface temperatures. So now this one is a uh, another option I selected. I'd say, well, just look at the ocean and tell me what the surface temperature looks like, and you know, it'll colorize it. I can see, you know, it's now the reason why it's black here is those clouds. The software knows that it sees clouds. You can't see the surface. See certain surfaces who don't take a don't, don't uh, colorize that. But here I got these warm plumes off of the off of California, and I can see where the water is is warmer and where it's cooler. I can I can see uh, and measure temperatures of the sea and actually get a colorized image of it, of it when it when the software finishes uh, recording an image. Uh, surface temperatures, so a colorized surface temperature. Here, just colorized everything. But um, looking down here, hot down here, cooler up here, and getting even cooler, a little bit darker up here. And then these clouds are, are the coldest, and they show up as blue. Uh, but the software didn't try to separate clouds from the land, so you have to kind of ignore that. But right here, warmest right through here, through Southern California, uh, Nevada, um, South. West Arizona, getting into Mexico. Here in southern and south, southwest Texas is kind of hot. So we can kind of record these, uh, see what the temperatures look like, and you can colorize them. Uh, hurricane. So this was a hurricane uh, last year that passed over um, Louisiana going into Texas. This is Hurricane uh, Laura. This image here, this is a thermal image, and this was taken at night. I just wanted to look at cloud, and if I do just the clouds, I get the thermal image. Can actually see clouds better because clouds are colder than the ground. So ground is very warm. Right here we got the Hurricane Laura, and here's the eye of the storm here. And we see the spiraling pattern of these clouds. I could get a picture every couple hour, you know, every hour or something like that for parts of the day and watch, actually watch the hurricane change its position. And by the way, the smaller the eye of the storm, the stronger the hurricane. So if we get another hurricane, I get another, I get another picture. I can look at this, the relative sizes of the eye of the storm. And I can determine which hurricane would be, which should be stronger. And by stronger, I mean higher winds. Higher wind speeds, the smaller the eye of the storm. So I got a picture of Hurricane Laura. Now, I'm going to be a disadvantage since I live in Idaho here. I can't get the west east coast. So I can't get some of those hurricanes that go further out to the, to the east, like those that pass over uh, Florida, for instance. Those that are people that are in the Midwest who do this, Bit images of the east and west coast get to see a lot of really cool stuff. <laughs> uh, wildfires. Now, this is last year, about a year ago, 11 months ago, 12 months ago. I took a picture at night and I looked at just the thermal infrared image and I wanted to see if I could see the wildfires. So, again, notice here I've got the Colorado River. I can see that, the Grand Canyon, hot spots in Southern California. Basin and range is a series of mountain ranges that run that roughly parallel to each other. High elevation, it's cooler. Lower elevation in the uh, basins, it's darker. I can see the basin range I can see is a series of, of ridges, basically ridge mountains. Look over here in California, along here, these little, these little pinpoints here, little dots here, those are fires. Those are actual ongoing fires from seen from space. And I know they're fires because they're small and they're dark spots, so they're hot. Right. They're in um, Oregon here. I've got several spots here. I'm looking at these little spots here. Those are wildfires. And I can actually see the location of wildfire relative to where I'm at. Uh, smoke from fire. So this is, we have to do, I did a daytime pass here. Here in Northern California, we had a fire and you see the smoke boom blowing out this way. Uh, in uh, Oregon, got these fires here and the smoke out here also. So lucky I'm in between the smoke plume. But when the air quality gets bad because of smoke, um, I would, if I do these satellite images, I expect to see the smoke plume passing over my location here in Oregon. So actually seeing 
uh, the air quality is bad because of smoke. You can actually see the smoke plumes leaving fires. Um, this was on a summer evening. This was hot. This is probably back at the end of July last year. Took an image at night and looked at just the thermal image. And you see my clock is a little off because the boundaries don't line up. Look at here, all throughout here. Yuma, Arizona, um, Southern California, uh, Las Vegas. The, uh, looking here at the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River and the Green River, um, Great Salt Lake, all the stuff. This is in, here in Southern Texas. I mean, these are just hot, hot, hot uh, because they're, they're dark. I can, I can see that they're, they're very hot. Um, some cloud cover over the central, central California, but if you get away from the clouds, it's hot in Central California also. You got that, that, that ring here you can see. It's very, very hot. Going up into Washington, um, this is the Columbia River here. So I can see the Columbia River is warmer than the surrounding grounds. I can see the rivers. Uh, yeah. So yeah, this is just to be Columbia River also here through, through uh, Idaho. I can see, and here's the Mississippi River and Missouri Rivers coming in. They're warmer than the surrounding land, so I can see the rivers because of the temperature change. Just whole area down here in Southwest uh, US, just, just baking hot, and I can see that just the thermal image. Um, one thing you might notice sometimes when you're taking images with weathered image is that the image changes like this. This is an image taken during the winter time. The, uh, we were on channel two and four, or no, we're on channel three and four here, get down to where the sun is up, and we actually see the ground and the satellite changed from mid infrared to thermal infrared, switch to the um, visible to near infrared image. So here, looking at where the, the camera is actually switched off, and here the camera switched on because we're, we are far enough south where the sun has risen, and we can actually start seeing the so you'll see sometimes the panels will turn on and off depending on where the satellite's at, and whether it's daytime or nighttime down there. You'll you'll get this you'll get this to happen. And that basically is my presentation on getting on a recording weather satellite images. I hope that oops, cancel that. Let me go back to you guys here. Um, hope you guys enjoyed that, and, and I've convinced some of you to. A setup is an SDR radio, spend about $100 in parts, or make your own your um, your own turn style antenna and make your your own antenna and save roughly half the price, two thirds of the price to start receiving other satellite images. We can't see anything from the balloons from here, but you get a really cool look of the ground from space. And happy to take any, any questions. Hey, Paul, so how long does one pass take to receive? Sorry, okay, so about, so it depends on if it's really low to the horizon, it doesn't get very high, the male maximum elevation is low, maybe 10 minutes. If it passes directly over, it's about a 15 minute pass. So roughly 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, so I have a question from Belgium. Okay, go ahead, <laughs> go ahead, Belgium. <laughs> You are the antenna you're using. This is not an azimut and elevation tracking system. Is it just a normal vertical? No, it is azimuth elevation tracking because I hook it to my arm and I swing my arm around. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't. And the antenna. The, the reason I use transcell antennas is that the satellite's orientation to the ground changes as it passes overhead. So if they used a dipole. Orientation would change, you would end up with a good signal, bad signal. So use circularly polarized signals and uh, use a turnstile antenna to pick those up. So it's okay. just a turnstile. You can, like I said, you can mount it to the roof of your house and point it straight up and you'll get perfectly good satellite images. You just won't get as good images of the, of, of the north and south uh, horizon. If you tilt the antenna, you'll get, you'll get slightly better. So you don't, you don't have to make it out as meth. Uh, it's easy enough. I mean, it's a 15 minute pass. I don't mind standing like an idiot in my backyard pointing an antenna up at the sky and my neighbors wonder what I'm doing. So um, if you have the stationary and mounted stationary, you can put an amplifier on it. It'll take power off of the USB cable. You'll get good images. You'll know, amplify the signal so you get good images of the, of the north and south, north and south horizons and you don't have to steer your antenna. So as, as a reference with my, my vertical antenna, which is a, a diamond 510, 
Mm. I could actually, I can actually easily pick up the passes from the International Space Station. Now, relative to the space station, how high are these satellites? So the International Space Station is around uh, 150 miles. These satellites are closer to 400. So okay. the NOAA satellites will take a little bit longer for a pass because it's a little bit higher. But then okay. you're, but you're not talking all the height here. You know, fifty percent higher or something like. That. All right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What frequency ranges were these operating in? I missed that. If you said. So it's one hundred thirty-seven megahertz. It's one hundred thirty-seven point one to one hundred thirty-seven point nine, roughly. So one hundred thirty-seven megahertz, just below the two-meter band. And Paul, what you're what you're seeing is real time signal coming down from the satellite as it's re taking a picture and then transmitting it down. Exactly. So there are people out there who think, well, I can just go to the internet and I'll just get the latest picture. But this is me going out in the middle of the night <laughs> or in the morning and getting an image as the satellite passes over right now. Yes, it is as live as it's happening. As it's happening right now. Hey, Paul, Miss Keith. <laughs> I assume that uh, a good aero antenna would work too, especially one that's got both two, two meter and 440 on it. I think with two meters should be fine. This, and then um, I, I don't know if you want to tilt, I guess it's gotta be circularly polarized is, is how you want to receive it, which I assume the arrow, the arrow do circularly polarized. I don't honestly know the answer to that question. Okay, okay. so that no, may be a problem. The Aggies. Okay, so I think that would be a problem because a satellite is transmitting a circularly polarized signal uh, because your relative orientation between the transmitting and receiving antenna changes as the satellite passes overhead. I, I, that may not work for you. The okay. installs are really easy to make. I made one out of PVC and wire, uh, you know, almost 30 years ago. Yeah, I, I made a lot of those kind of things out of tape measures and PVC pipes. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. You got it. Yep. 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 Okay. Thanks. <laughs> From Belgium about the arrow antenna. I think it actually will work because recently at the club, we have been following Leo's low Earth bit orbital ones. And as you actually get them in the hand, as you say, and you slightly twist and turn, the signal will indicate what angle you have to turn it. So you're you're following as the satellite is rotating. I'm, I'm pretty sure it would actually work, yes. So I'll be you willing said, to give it a try because I, I use that satellite a lot. I mean, that antenna a lot for satellite satellites and for the ISS, so. Okay, so you so look at the STR Sharp waterfall display and just rotate to keep the signal as strong as possible. But yeah, just follow live, time, live on the STR Sharp and that should work. Sure, okay. <laughs> 